Hello and welcome back to Abstract Linear Algebra, the video series where we talk a lot about general vector spaces. And now in today's part 5, we will learn how we can translate these abstract objects to very concrete ones. Namely, we will talk about coordinates of vectors and the so-called basis isomorphism. But before we go into the details and the definitions, first I really want to thank all the nice people who support the channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via Patreon. And please don't forget that you find a lot of additional material with the link in the description. Okay, then let's start with the important topic here, which I call coordinates with respect to a given basis. So this is immediately important to remember, if we talk about coordinates, we always have a fixed basis in mind. Indeed, I would say it will be helpful that I write all the assumptions down first. And first our field F is either given by the real numbers or by the complex numbers. So we only consider these two cases, but we will deal with them simultaneously. Hence we just say V is an F vector space. Moreover, we also want to fix the dimension of V as a natural number N. In particular, we need a finite dimensional vector space here. Okay, and now this means a basis of V has exactly N elements. Therefore, now let's fix a basis and let's call it B. And then the elements should be B1, B2 and so on. And with this, we have fixed N elements that span the whole vector space V. And in addition, we also know that they are linearly independent. So for example, if you visualize them with arrows, they go in N different directions. Moreover, each vector in V can be written as a linear combination with these basis vectors. And indeed, this is done in a unique way. And this is exactly the way we can define coordinates with respect to the basis B. So let's write that down. Each vector V in V can be uniquely written as the following linear combination. So we simply have scalars in F, we can call alpha 1, alpha 2 and so on. And now the uniquely part here means that you cannot take any other scalars to reach V with the basis vectors B1 to Bn. And with that we already have our first definition here. These real or complex numbers are called the coordinates of V. More precisely, these are the coordinates of V with respect to the given basis B. This means if you fix a basis B, you can write down any abstract vector V just with ordinary numbers from R or C. And obviously, this immediately helps us for calculations. Indeed, it means that we can reuse everything we already know from Rn and Cn. Hence, you should always remember that we can write down a linear combination for V and then we immediately get a one-to-one -one correspondence for Fn. Simply because the information in the column vector alpha1, alpha2 and so on is exactly the same information we have in our vector V. Or saying that more mathematically, if you have V, you can build this column vector and if you have any column vector, you get an abstract vector here. And usually this column vector here on the right hand side in Fn we call the coordinate vector of V. And with that you should get the general idea. We want to translate everything from the abstract vector space V into this concrete one Fn. And then here in Fn we can use the full power of our linear algebra knowledge. Therefore I would say it's helpful to put this whole idea into a picture. Hence, let's sketch our general abstract vector space V here. And now we have learned, the important thing is that we also fix a basis B inside V. In fact, this whole one-to-one -one translation here only works because we fixed the basis B at the beginning. And then we are able to go to the lower level, to the concrete level of Fn. I call this the concrete vector space Fn, simply because we already know that very well from the last course. And there, please recall, in Fn we always have the standard basis. This one you should know, it's simply given by the canonical unit vectors. And with that, the whole translation here is fixed and it's given by a map we call phi with index b. So you see, we fix the name of the basis in the name of the map. And now in order to make this translation work, 
we also need an inverse map of this phi b. Therefore, the question now should be, how can we define this map? And from before, we already know what to do, because every v can be written as a linear combination. And now this linear combination we map to a column vector. And in this column vector, we only find the coordinates alpha 1 to alpha n of v. So there we have our map phi b, which goes from v into fn. And indeed, we already know it's a bijection. But moreover, it's also a so-called linear map. Later, we will talk a lot about such linear maps in a general setting. But essentially, here it means exactly the same thing as for linear maps in Rn. Namely, if you have two abstract vectors in the vector addition, you can pull out this addition sign from the map. In other words, it does not matter if you first do the vector addition and then apply the map, or if you first apply the map and then do the vector addition. However, please note that we have two different vector additions here. On the left hand side we have the abstract one in V and on the right hand side the very concrete one in Fn. Ok, but linear means exactly two things, namely first the one with the vector addition and the other one with the scalar multiplication. This means if you have a scalar lambda here, you are also allowed to pull it out. So again, a similar thing, it does not matter if you first do the scaling and then the map, or first the map and then the scaling. Still, again, the only difference is which scaling, which scalar multiplication we take. Ok, so now you know this important definition of phi b, and I can also tell you the name of the map. It's a very important map, and it carries the nice name basis isomorphism. And here you can already remember, in general, isomorphism just means we have a linear map that is also bijective. And here we call phi b basis isomorphism, because it maps the one basis to the standard basis in Fn. In fact, this is also something you should remember. If you put a basis element into phi b, then you get out a standard basis element. So you see, bj is mapped to ej. And here please recall, ej is the column vector that has zeros everywhere except at the jth position. So it's the canonical unit vector as we want it. And here you should see, this property comes immediately out of this definition. Moreover, you should also see that instead of this explicit definition here, we could also use that property. But then we also have to say that we want a linear map. Ok, so now the crucial thing you should remember here is that we translate abstract vectors in the basis B into very concrete ones in the standard basis of Fn. And this is the whole idea, because then we can do all the calculations here on this lower level and in the end we can just translate back. So this is exactly how we can combine abstract vector spaces with our knowledge of linear algebra. And of course we should demonstrate that with some examples. However, I would say let's do that in the next video. Therefore, I really hope we meet again and have a nice day. Bye bye.